for the uh, a, a further uh, discussion of a 2015 paper, uh, which you'll find in the references. But uh, the topic is turbo rockets. It's a, a name that's been used uh, in a couple different ways, but in this particular configuration, we're going to talk about the integration of hypersonic air breathing with uh, rocket propulsion uh, for access to space. And again, um, I'm representing myself. I'm a full-time engineer, um, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, today I'm going to talk a lot about um, turbo rockets and their background and improvements thereof. Um, introduce a new variant of uh, turbo rockets which started out as nuclear, but now have nuclear and stage combustion variants as well, which means fully chemical, not, uh, not requiring a nuclear reactor. Uh, talk about uh, performance uh, of the cycle, and then we'll talk a little bit about economics. The economics uh, part of this uh, presentation is not included in the paper. It's actually an extension of the work uh, from the 2015 paper, but um, hopefully between the two, you'll get a good picture of why I'm pursuing this so heavily. So for background, I'm going to talk a lot about the state of the art for rocket ascent and economics for orbit. Uh, my background, uh, I was a professional rocket uh, cycle developer at SpaceX. I was, in fact, I was in charge of the R&D group uh, working on the Raptor, the full flow stage combustion cycle uh, for the interplanetary transport system about six years ago. So when I'm talking about uh, comparison to state of the art, I'm actually comparing uh, myself to work I did back then. So um, anything that's uh, subsequent to that or not public knowledge, I'm not going to talk about, but um, it's all this work will be derived from public sources. So if you're a uh, launch provider or an aspiring launch provider and you look at um, what your competition is doing, I apologize if you can't see this on the screen, but uh, this uh, report is from January this year, talks about access uh, to LEO for payload, and it's a dollars per kilogram. And as you go from left to right, the prices are dropping rapidly, and SpaceX is uh, down at the bottom right now with their Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy reusable rockets. And that number is only going to get worse. So if you want to compete in that market, you have to have an economic solution. But in general, um, if you want to do off-Earth development, there's lots of reasons to do so. Um, nothing quite yet is very economical. We're still talking about thousands of dollars per kilogram for access to orbit, and those prices are too high for um, widespread use. Uh, as I said earlier, the, there is a recently uh, proposed uh, air breathing cycle called the Nuclear Thermal Turbo Rocket, which was able to improve the payload fraction of orbit by a factor of five to seven, which reduces that uh, cost per kilogram by um, a significant margin. Uh, and so, again, we're talking about uh, the implications and the improvements of that uh, improvement in this, uh, this presentation. So for background, the nuclear thermal turbo rocket is a supercharged air augmented nuclear thermal turbo rocket. And it's a combined cycle architecture. Uh, this audience should be aware combined cycle combines either um, gas turbines uh, and, um, and scramjets or rockets and scramjets and ramjets. And so this is a combined cycle system. Uh, supercharged in this uh, context means that it's using a, a compressor in addition to inlet compression. So the reason for this uh, combination is that the nuclear thermal rockets already have very high specific impulse. Um, not clear if this audience works in rocket terms. Specific impulse is um, pounds of thrust or pounds of propellant use. So it's the uh, efficiency term. So uh, nuclear thermal rockets are the only ones that are uh, launch capable. They have a high enough thrust to rate ratio to get off the ground, but they don't perform very well uh, for payload to orbit. And they are very expensive because they're not developed very well. And then hypersonics um, have much better specific impulse, and we'll talk about that much more. So if you want to do uh, something that has the best overall ISP to orbit, uh, you probably want to combine those two. And that's what the prior paper talks about, and we're going to talk about improvements in that as well. In this slide, um, these are all the rockets that have, uh, have published data on. Um, apologize if you can't read them, but uh, across the uh, x-axis, we talk about specific impulse. All the chemical rockets are uh, pretty well grouped on the left. The highest performers are uh, Hydrolox, including the Space Shuttle main engine, which has an ISP of about four, 450 seconds. These vertical lines are theor theoretical maximum for all these cycles. Um, so you can see Methalox is a little bit lower than Hydrolox. So the Saturn V up, upper stages and then the space shuttle are in this region. On the other hand, uh, nuclear thermal rockets, because the molecular weight of the propellant is so much lower, at only a uh, um, molecular weight of two, they have between 950 and 1,000 seconds of ISP. So substantially higher than chemical rockets that are available. 
for reference, this is a chart of the specific impulse as a function of free stream Mach number. So if you say Mach 25 is uh, orbital velocity, this is what uh, a, a turbo rocket can achieve. And depending on the configuration, their mission averages are between 1430 and 1788 seconds, which is, again, substantially higher than chemical rockets. We'll talk a little bit about, about the mode configurations, but this rocket is able to uh, operate as a rocket fan up to Mach 3, a ramjet up to about Mach 8, and then a ramjet about Mach, 10, Mach 14 before con configuring itself as a, as a full rocket. Uh, for reference, most chemical rockets use uh, staging, which you know, means discarding uh, a booster mass as a way to improve performance, whereas this rocket stays in a single configuration all the way to orbit, so it is a single stage to orbit rocket. So a little bit more detail about how these mode transitions work. This is schematic, which I'll talk about in detail in the next slide. But the free stream is uh, traveling to the left in this image. And you can see that there is a, a core and a few other components. So in, in the first configuration, you're actually spinning uh, a rotor disk with a supersonic through, through flow fan uh, that's rocket propelled. The trailing edge of these blades are, um, are the rocket nozzles, and it's able to impart a momentum to this probably blade, or fan blade, in which case it's uh, raising the pressure ratio by a factor of about two to two to three. So that from launch to about Mach 1, it's operating strictly as a rocket fan with uh, air, entering, air entering the left and combusting and exiting the right. As it transitions to ramjet, the inlet uh, ramps uh, extend a little bit, so you have a two-angle ramp and a variable nozzle outlet with a subsonic combustor in the middle. And eventually the transition to a scramjet where the inlet uh, extends even further to provide uh, sufficient capture area. And then it's thermally throttled. It has an overall expansion ratio of about um, 300 to 1 uh, because of the uh, using the whole body of the vehicle as an expander. And the last but not least, the inlet, since it's a variable cone, is able to close off and operate purely as a rocket the rest of the way orbit. So what do we have in the schematic? Um, again, this is a, a fully, uh, highly integrated system. The, uh, the propellant tanks to the left, you have an air path down the middle, and you have the uh, turbo machine uh, rotating with the core as the ID. This rocket fan has about 116 um, um, fan blades, which again have um, the rocket nozzles are a linear aero spike on the trailing edge. In this case, the nuclear uh, reactor is providing um, energy to the propellant, in this case liquid hydrogen, expanding it and propelling it through the, the rotor blades, which combine with the ambient oxygen to provide thrust. The outlet nozzle is a pitching out balance beam configuration, which means it's able to both uh, provide um, gimbling effectively uh, for uh, thrust diversion and change the cross-sectional area for optimal performance. Uh, the details of what else is on here, um, we can talk about um, afterwards, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, stage combustion variant, which, as you can see, is very similar, but it has two combustors. It has um, a pre-burner combustor, which operates a very rich oxygen to fuel ratio of about 0.9 uh, during the air breathing portions of the, of the operation, in which case the discharge of the pre-burner goes to the rocket nozzles and out the back. And then when it transitions to pure rocket mode, uh, the turbo pumps feed a much higher O to F, about 6 to 1, through the rocket nozzle on the core. So up to about Mach 14 in the air breathing, it's uh, running very rich and using the excess hydrogen as fuel. And then as it transitions to a rocket, um, it's operating as a, a normal hydrolox rocket engine. So what does this mean? Um, for comparison, uh, the state of the art has payload fractions uh, between 2 and 5% of the available reusable rockets uh, from SpaceX. The 2015 paper compares itself to the Block 2 Falcon, which was flying at the time. Um, late last year, the Falcon 9 Block 5 started flying, which is a substantially higher performance uh, vehicle, um, and then subsequently a substantially higher payload fraction. Falcon Heavy reusable payload is not actually disclosed, and so there are estimates on my part, but you can see since they're very similar architectures, they're going to have very similar payload fractions. Uh, for comparison, the Big Falcon rocket, the follow-on, um, actually it's fully reusable, so it takes a bit of a uh, payload hit uh, because both the upper and blue stages are reusable. By comparison, the, the nuclear thermal thermo thermo rocket is about just shy of 26% payload fraction of orbit, which is, uh, you can see, a substantial improvement over pure chemical rockets. 
So how did this uh, become possible? Well, uh, there are a number of things that will improve the performance of an air-breathing rocket. There's a couple items. Firstly, we talk about trajectory. The original uh, trajectory I proposed uh, in 2015 was an air breather and bored a hole in the air all the way to Mach 25, which is over the velocity you can see. And by pulling a pull-up maneuver, once we transition the um, pure rocket, and gets out of the atmosphere, the aerodynamic drag dra drops substantially, and you get a substantial bump in, uh, in uh, actual average ISP because you're not, uh, or um, effective ISP because you uh, have, don't have those aerodynamic losses. Next is core diameter optimization. Not a huge bump, but by going from a, a narrow 3.66 meter core to a 5 meter core, you're able to um, improve your surface area to volume ratios and reduce your tank at the mass. That is more important uh, or more effective as you uh, have a trajectory that spends more time out of the atmosphere as the new trajectory uh, shows. Last, uh, something that uh, rockets do fairly frequently but air breathers don't do as much, uh, these uh, mode changes all abort, uh, go to the next about 1800 Kelvin um, inlet temperature to the combustor. By adding extra fuel, uh, cryogenic fuel as transpiration cooling in the center body, it drops the wall temperature by about 200 Kelvin, and you're able to extend the operation as an air breather up to from Mach 14 and a half to Mach 18. As you can see, the area under the curve improves substantially. And you can see that extra couple of percentage points improves the total payload fraction of orbit to almost 35%. Now, uh, because of the surface area to volume issue and, and other scaling factors, um, scaling favors rocketry hugely. So as you go up bigger, your payload fractions go up substantially. So the scale-up I'm talking about is increasing the reactor power from 1 gigawatt to about 6 gigawatts. You can see the improvement uh, from a 5-meter diameter core to 11-meter diameter core. The total length improves it a lot, and your payload fractions are slightly over 50%. Similarly, the stage combustion vehicle has uh, two configurations I'm going to talk about, a 50-kilopound uh, vacuum thrust version and a 258-kilopound vacuum thrust version. Now we're going to stop. Uh, we're not going to go all the way back to where the uh, nuclear thermal was. We're going to start off with a 5 meter core and go straight to active combustion cooling. Because the ISP is so much lower on, on the uh, chemical variant, uh, the more time as an air breather improves its payload fraction substantially. And in fact, both are right around 35% for payload fraction for the 5 meter variant. But because of the um, affirmation issues, the, uh, the scaling doesn't improve quite as much. You're only about 42% total payload fraction on orbit on the, on the largest variant. So for reference, I'm going to start talking about um, assumptions on how uh, I come to a, a cost to orbit in dollars per kilogram. And I'm comparing myself to all the current SpaceX um, variants and their cost models. The Falcon 9 reusable um, has a capability of about 50 kilopounds of payload to orbit, um, but they're only using about 28 uh, because of structural um, considerations. They advertise a launch cost of about $62 million, and propellant costs are, at, are assumed about $1,000 a ton. These are, um, strangely enough, well matched to my, uh, my economic model, which assumes um, a, a reference uh, material cost and scales that about, about 50 times to get the total uh, launch cost. So that includes some amount of margin, but it, uh, it applies to all the vehicles considered here. Falcon Heavy, a uh, reusable, um, has about three times the payload as you might expect, and has a launch cost only 50% higher. But uh, you'll see what that means in the next slide. But it's uh, very similar in total um, in total cost of orbit. For reference, the Big Falcon rocket is a much bigger vehicle, as you can see. It's got 330 kilopound to orbit, uh, and its launch cost uh, is for both the launch stage and the upper stage about 360 million. And the biggest difference is they're assuming 168 dollars a ton for propellant costs, and that's you know, leveraging the, um, the natural gas resource for the source of methane. For comparison, uh, the vehicles I'm modeling have a very high cost of uh, manufacturing the reactor, and then liquid hydrogen at about $3,080 a ton. Similarly, the, uh, the, since the, the cost scales linearly with uh, <coughs> mass, you can see that the stage combustion variant, which is this little guy here in the middle, is very much smaller than the nuclear thermal rocket with the same core diameter. Therefore, its cost is substantially lower. The big guys, 11 meter uh, stage combustion and nuclear thermal rockets, uh, are quite expensive because of the reactor has some cost assumptions. But um, still, uh, not 
and not uh, very much different from the BFR for total payload and cost. So these next slides I'm going to talk about a dollar per kilogram. Uh, that's dollar per kilogram to lower Earth orbit. That's the cost on the y-axis. Uh, the number of flights is on the x-axis. And these are vehicles that uh, we're familiar with. And right now the Falcons are all assumed to have about 10 uses uh, before major overhauls. None of them have flown more than two currently. But you can see that the payload costs start about $4,000 a kilogram and drop below $1,000 um, after 10 flights. The big Falcon rocket, on the other hand, um, with just its first flight, is just under $3,000 a kilogram and improves down below um, $200 a kilogram uh, at uh, 25 flights. For reference, the old uh, NTTR started out quite good um, at $4,000 a kilogram and improves over time because it's, uh, it's able to have much higher payload fraction. The improvements I've uh, presented earlier improve that because the payload fractions go up so much uh, that it's a dollar per kilogram goes, goes down and the stage combustion variants, because they're so small and lightweight, um, are very much uh, better than anything that the state of the art offers. The 11 meter nuclear thermal rockets is about comparable to the, um, to the BFR, but the stage combustion variant costs are substantially lower. If you zoom in and go out to 25 uh, flights per vehicle, these costs are low enough that uh, there's been advocates saying that uh, for levelized cost of power, if you can get down below $200 a kilogram to geostationary orbit, which is just not quite there yet, you can compete with coal and uh, oil uh, to generate power. And you can see that these uh, numbers are much lower than that. At 25 flights, the 11 meter stage uh, combustion system is at $37 per kilogram in orbit. Now, this is not the only mission. It turns out that there are um, no other architectures out there that are able to do uh, near-Earth return. Near-Earth return is, um, call it uh, anything that's uh, uh, within the Earth's orbit and uh, capable of, uh, of rockets that are capable of getting there and back. And in fact, um, this rocket is capable of getting back with refueling orbit, which is the same thing that the, the Big Falcon rocket is proposing. So what I'm going to do is compare uh, all the way to lunar surface and back again. Uh, the Big Falcon rocket doesn't have quite enough uh, uh, ISP, or I'm sorry, Delta V to get all the way to the lunar surface and back. And it needs five additional flights from um, the Earth's surface to refuel it in orbit. And it has 137 kilopounds to, um, to lunar surface. By comparison, uh, the stage combustion 11 meter rocket can do uh, to lunar surface and back with two refuel flights, and the nuclear thermal can do it with one with a substantially higher payload. Because the BFR can't get back, it has a $12,000 per kilogram uh, to lunar surface uh, cost, whereas the nuclear thermal rocket does much better since its in space ISP is double what the stage combustion is. It's able to get down below $1,000 per kilogram to lunar orbit or to lunar surface, which is, again, better than the stage combustion rocket. So this 2,000 pound, kilopound payload is one-fourth of the ISS. So you can go and take the ISS from the Earth's surface all the way to the lunar surface with four flights. Now, something that I realized just yesterday is that uh, my NTTR is a much more expensive rocket than the stage combustion. If you use the stage combustion for strictly for tankage and a nuclear rocket for payload, costs are substantially lower yet again. So, in conclusion, this rocket is a paradigm shift. It's substantially higher performance than anything uh, proposed so far. It has payload fractions over 50% at the highest configuration with low construction costs and designed for full reuse. I did talk about it earlier, but these, uh, these masses for tankage include uh, full uh, thermal protection systems for the entire vehicle for reentry. So arrow braking and reentry is, is part of the, uh, the design from the get-go. For 10 flights, which is about what the Falcons are doing today, cost of Leo can be less than $85 a kilogram. And cost of Luna can be below $750 a kilo. Stage combustion obviously is lowest cost of Leo, and then nuclear thermal is lowest cost for near-earth return, and has the highest payload fractions. And it's the first such known uh, vehicle to get all the way to Leo with uh, these high, high payload fractions. Now, last, of course I think someone should do this. It's substantially higher than anything else currently uh, conceived of. 
and the prior version was nuclear, and that was a, a big problem. But actually separating the air breathing portion and the nuclear into two different uh, vehicles, they can be developed serially, and you can get most of the benefit. And frankly, this is an assemblage of, of currently proposed technologies, not new technology development. So conceivably, this is just execution. So what do I ask you as the audience? Please give me feedback. If I made conceptual errors, math errors, or anything like that, please let me know. And if you're interested in collaborating, also, please let me know. Um, there's my contact information, uh, and I thank you for your time. I'm um, open to any questions. Got a couple questions. Uh, in your life cycle cost analysis, did you include um, the impact of uh, attrition due to random failures? No, not at all. That's included partially in the, um, the accounting for the, uh, the vehicle assemblage at 50 times cost back. And unless somebody else, uh, I got a second question. Um, what are the, uh, how to put this? Time factors for return to flight, recover, re replenish whatever, and um, and turn around and launch again. With the nuclear, it, uh, it can be different from the liquids, of course. Of course. So, um, for reference, all these uh, combustor combustor temps are kept intentionally very low, such that uh, especially for the nuclear variant, it doesn't have uh, material loss inside the reactor, so the inside the reactor temperatures are very low. Um, all the uh, combustor temperatures in the air breathing portion are about normal for current uh, gas turbines. So I uh, expect it to be very similar um, level of maintenance required compared to a commercial aircraft. So at that point, it's just landing. It's, these are all vertical takeoff, vertical landing configurations. So imagine you're going back to the pad and refueling and be able to launch again. There shouldn't be any maintenance requirements past, you know, until the first few hundred flights. Yeah, please. What are the radiation in terms of the Okay, so uh, the nuclear thermal variant um, includes a lot of uh, radiation shielding. I think I'm a little bit overkill, but the way it's designed, uh, it has a, a, a tungsten carbide uh, gamma shield and then um, has a boron uh, tetracarbide um, neutron shield. So the payload experiences about 0.05 rads per flight, and surface observers, if you're close enough, if you're like right on launch pad, it's about one rad per flight. Uh, for reference, um, most of you, if you don't fly commercial aircraft, you get about two-tenths of a rad per year. Um, and if you fly commercial aircraft, you get three to four. Uh, astronauts on ISS, you get between four and ten. So um, it's designed from the get-go to be heavily radiation shielded. And in fact, uh, the reactor mass, um, seven-eighths of it is shielded. Anyone else? In the back? Sir? Did I understand you said that you would push your scramjet mode to mock me? That's the transpiration. Yep, that's correct. Right. It's very low. It's very low contraction ratios when we're going to do things. Um, because I'm using uh, hydro hot hydrogen as my propellant, uh, its uh, induction time is 20,000 times lower than the cryogenic. So I don't need quite as much compression to get it lit. And then because my contraction ratios are so, uh, so low, I don't exceed the combustion like temperature uh, that uh, heavy heavy fuel run into uh, into much higher. Uh, and I'm operating quite high. I don't know if you've looked at it, but scramjet's uh, 150,000 feet of altitude. Yeah, so if, uh, you mentioned the low earth orbit refueling station. Will that be, um, will that be just gaseous hydrogen? No, actually, it's uh, intended to be um, one other of these vehicles launched fully uh, and then uh, fluid exchange in orbit. Back again here. Um, What's the uh, technology readiness level or state of the art of the nuclear component? That's a great question. Um, certainly, uh, factors for uh, nuclear thermal propulsion are something that had a dead period between the 60s and now. Uh, but there's been a lot of work in the last 15 years. Um, I don't know that anyone's quite ready to build one yet. Um, NASA's got a, um, a project to revive basically the reactor technology from the 60s. Um, what used to be called um, Babcock and Wilcox has got a contract with NASA to, to create a new nuclear thermal rocket. Um, it is not currently available, that's for sure. But uh, the numerical tools are quite good, uh, and the handling, it's, it's just a matter of reviving the technology. Uh, there haven't been really compelling cases for building 
uh, new geothermal rockets because the only application has been in space. So you have to get the reactor up there. One of the advantages of this architecture is the reactor goes with you um, as part of the vehicle architecture. So most reactors can be bimodal. You can use them for both uh, rocket propulsion and uh, electricity generation. So conceivably for um, you know, set down the lunar surface or anywhere else, uh, if you didn't want to come back, you can leave, leave the reactor there as a power supply. You saw the power, uh, new, the thermal power numbers of these reactors are quite high. Um, so they're, they're, they're necessary to get the thrust to weight for uh, thermal, nuclear thermal propulsion, but for using for lower power levels for power generation, they can last much, much longer. Does that answer your question? Oh, I got it. Okay, you got time for one? Yes, we got it. Okay, go ahead. We got two more minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm hogging the floor here. Um, I I got the impression that it's vertical recovery is vertical landing. Are you recovering with the the installed rocket or or the air breathing mode? Everything. Um, so the the uh, the, the system, if, you know, very low fuel on, on board. It's actually um, quite good from a ballistic coefficient perspective. So it does air break, uh, air braking all the way down to a couple hundred meters per second. And since it's so light, because it's that empty propellant, uh, it, doesn't, it only needs the pure rocket to land. It doesn't need the uh, air breathing portion uh, thrust augmentation to land. So it's got a, a thrust weight ratio of about three uh, when it's empty. So you know, you're able to break with the, the aer aerodynamic devices all the way down just a few hundred meters off the ground and, and come in tail free. Okay, I think that ends our time for questions. Great. Right. Move on to our next. Uh, thank you. But thank you for uh, starting us off with uh, really. Thank you very much.